All right, so we're going to introduce this class. Um, we're going to start out by talking about who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, that who wrote the book of Hebrews is um, a little bit uh, up for debate. Honestly, nobody really knows. Um, and before we get into it a little bit, um, wh why do you think wh why do you think I'm doing this? What, why, why do you think studying authorship would be important at all? Normally, it's a it's a test uh, used to determine if it's part of the canon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, legitimacy yeah. issues that come with authorship. Okay. You and I talked about that at the the other day. John and I. Um, um, he's tr translating Hebrews. He's going to talk about that this morning. But well, I'm not, no, I'm not. Oh, you're, you're testing the <laughs> translation. Yes. Yeah. You're, yeah. Yeah. Let me rephrase. You're you're uh, you're uh, testing the translation. Right. Um, so what, what else? What, what else do you think about the authorship piece? When you know the author, you know what perspective they're coming from, their background. Right. Yeah, that's a really good idea too. That um, you know, authorship uh, gives us perspective. So I'll I'll give you a heads up. When we're done, we're not going to know the author, okay? Um, but I, I do want to I want to present you a few options and um, just kind of my my two cents on on what I think. But um, the the historical understanding for many, many people um, has been that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, and the reason for that understanding, um, first of all, is that when the original manuscript of Hebrews was found, it was found in a bundle of other Pauline literature. And so a lot of people, because of that, uh, just assumed that Paul wrote it because it, it was found in this bundle of other, of other manuscripts. Um, the other thing was uh, that not the original manuscript. Right, right, yes. Early manuscripts. Er, er, the earliest yes. manuscripts. Um, and so a lot of people just assumed that this must be Pauline because it was in these early manuscripts. Also, um, many of the very early church fathers affirmed that they believed that that Paul was the author of it. Um, Clement of Alexandria, Origen. Um, these are people that lived about 150. Um, or so, um, 160. So, um, pretty early on, uh, there was an understanding um, of um, Paul's authorship. Now, the bigger case for me is themes, the themes of Hebrews. Um, and so, I would like to, um, I'd like to hand these out if I can. Um, just kind of, Brent, if you if you look up Colossians, um, uh, um, John, if you look up First Corinthians. Um, Rob, Philippians, um, Andrea, Second Corinthians, here, and James Romans, Hi. Um, And uh, just so you know, also with this class, um, I'll be I'll be producing this stuff for you guys. Um, on another chart on this, I had a formatting problem um, that was really, really <coughs> confusing to you. So I'm going to fix this, and I'll have this here next week. Um, I didn't have time to fix it this week, but you're going to get these notes. So you'll you'll have everything, um, everything that I have. So, all right, um, all right. Colossians one fifteen through seventeen. There you go. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. And then I'm going to read the corresponding Hebrews passages. These are Pauline. We, we know that Paul wrote these. So compare that. Let me read to you Hebrews 1 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So you see a theme there uh, between the two about, about Jesus uh, sustaining all things, being the radiance of God's glory. All right? 
1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. And then uh, the, the Hebrews passage 2, verse 4. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So again, you see this idea of the distribution of gifts um, and, and the impact that that's had. All right? Philippians 2, 7 through 8. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. All right, Hebrews um, 2, 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. All right? So you see this idea of the humanity of Jesus. By the way, uh, we are going to, man, we're going to skim the surface of this in today's sermon. But over the next few weeks, we will be getting into this. I think this is one of the finest passages in the Bible about the importance of Jesus' humanity. Um, we often think about the importance of his deity. He was fully God and fully human. Um, Hebrews uh, 2 really gives us a treat. And to why it is so important that we understand Jesus' humanity. We're gonna today in today's sermon we're, we're skimming it, uh, but we'll we'll do it idea by idea um, in, in the next one. All right, Second Corinthians three six. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. All right, but in fact the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. So you see this idea of the superiority of the ministry of Jesus and the superiority of the new covenant uh, versus the old covenant. All right, Romans 5, 9, and Romans 12, 1. Let's get both since, of those. Yeah. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? him. That's 5 9. Yeah. And 12 1 is, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. All right. Well, uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 10 14. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so um, I wanted to show you these uh, themes. Um, between what we know is, is the literature of Paul and, and then the, the literature of, uh, of, the, of, of the book of Hebrews. And you see some corresponding ideas there um, about uh, the superiority of Jesus, the superiority um, of his ministry. Um, a few arguments um, against, is, uh, against Paul writing it is that not all the early church fathers agreed. Um, there, there were people that... Um, Argued. I'll, I'll tell you kind of what was argued for uh, later. That there were people that were arguing against uh, Paul's authorship of uh, of Hebrews very very early on. Not as early as 150, but still pretty early um, in, in terms of the argument. And then as you dissect the book of Hebrews, um, there are some things in the book of Hebrews that would indicate an author um, other other than than Paul. That for one, these themes are similar. But the style of the writing, um, the, the style of the writing is really unlike anything of Paul's uh, that has has, has has ever survived. So, in keeping with the style, uh, stylistically, Hebrews was obviously written by a very well-educated person. Um, the, the Greek um, is uh, very literary, very ornate. It's just stylistically, the the, the writing is a little bit different um, than Paul's and. Um, John, you shared with me when we were meeting about one theory as to why it may sound stylistically but thematically be the same. Right, and this actually came from Clement of Alexandria, I found yeah. out. Okay. And he said that uh, his feeling was, in Origins as well, was that, I mean, we know from the book of Acts that Luke spent a great deal of time with Paul. And in fact, Luke kind of researched Paul's whole ministry, wrote up the book of Acts, and the thought of uh, those people was 
that it was written by Paul originally in Hebrew or Aramaic and Luke translated it. Right. Or other people have said that it's Paul's ideas, but Luke wrote them down. Wrote them down, yeah. And I had never heard that theory until I met with John and Panera this weekend. That idea makes a ton of sense to me um, because it includes these thematic combinations, but um, you know, you'll, you'll see here as Hebrews goes on that there are 150 words uh, in the book of Hebrews that appear nowhere else in your New Testament. So the vocabulary, you know, you would think if Paul was writing it, that that, that wouldn't happen. That, that we tend to use the same vocabulary again and again. And, and so, um, uh, so there's 150 words that are not found anywhere else in the New Testament. There are 10 that do not occur in any other Greek writing. So, I, I mean, that the, the language is really, really, really interesting um, and uh, hard, hard to translate, hard to study because of that. Um, the author does not introduce himself as Paul, um, which in... Uh, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, and 1st and 2nd Timothy, Paul does. Uh, he typically will introduce himself, but in Hebrews there's no introduction. Um, and its theology, although compatible with Paul, is very distinctive. So Paul never really talks much about Jesus as a priest. Uh, the big book of Hebrews has lots and lots of language um, about that. So. Um, those are the arguments for and against. Um, what are the other options? Barnabas is one option that a lot of people like. Um, uh, Apollos, who Martin Luther suggested, had, had done it. Um, and then there's a whole um, list of other people, Timothy, uh, Philip, uh, Priscilla, and I even read one theory about Mary, the mother of Jesus, having potentially written it, which um, I don't particularly love that, that theory, but... Um, it, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me, but um, the fact of the matter is we don't we don't know who the author is. Um, my two cents, I think, is probably Paul. To be honest, I like John's the theory John read about um, Paul writing it originally and then Luke potentially um, translating it later. So, what do we know about the author? Um, well educated, um, probably based on chapter two, verse three, probably a second generation Christian. Uh, it may have been written from Italy. The translation on that is a little bit difficult to understand, and probably um, a preacher, Pro probably. But let me share with you this quote um, from the uh, um, standard uh, Christian Standard Commentary. It says the writing of Hebrews reveals a compassionate pastor, a keen theologian, and a superior logician who applies all the sources of revelation and rhetoric at his command so that his dear friends will not drift away, all right? And if you were gonna look at, we're gonna look at themes here in just a minute, which is more important than authorship, although to your point, authorship helps us understand themes a little bit better. Um, that is one of the uh, big, big themes of the book of Hebrews, is perseverance, not drifting away, and all of that. So um, <clears throat> let's look at uh, the date and context of the letter because this is gonna lead us to the theme. Um, there's quite a bit of um, debate about when Hebrews was written. Most people think it was probably in the mid 60s. The reason for that is uh, Clement of Rome um, was written in 95 to 96, and he repeatedly references Hebrews in his writing. And so we know that Hebrews for sure existed by 95 or 96. The second clue to when Hebrews was written uh, was that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, all right? And there is no reference to it in Hebrews. And given that Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians, if the temple had been destroyed, you would assume that there'd be a reference to it in, in, in a book written to Jewish Christians. Um, the letter indicates in chapter 10, verses 33 through 34, 12, verse 4, 13, verse 3, and 13, verse 23, that the recipients of the letter were being persecuted, all right? Um, and so, um, so it's before 95, it's before 70, and it's written to Jewish Christians. Leads a lot of people to believe, and there, there is some agreement on this, that it was probably written 
um, in in uh, the the mid to, to late '60s, which is and here's why any of that is important is that that coincides with the rule and reign of a Roman emperor named Nero, and um, this makes a lot of sense for how Hebrews um, ends up being written. Is it's written to people that are being persecuted. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of this in in uh, the sermon this morning, but Nero. Um, is unlike a lot of leaders that we've ever seen in history in terms of how crazy he was. Um, that there are a number of stories about Nero. I'm, I'm fascinated, I, I tend to be very fascinated by Roman history. Um, I, I like Roman history, so I've been scouring Nero history in preparation for the series, and there's tons of stories that I would never share in public. I mean, they're so depraved. Uh, they're so terrible. Um, even the stories that I share in the sermon this morning, you know, you had to clean it up and edit it because the guy was so screwed up um, and, and so messed up and so and so depraved. Um, we, we know about him. Um, a lot of people, there was a great fire in Rome. A lot of people believe that Nero set that fire. Nero did not want to be blamed for setting that fire, so he blamed the Christians. And um, so that began, he had... He had an antagonistic attitude toward Christians before, but after the fire in Rome, um, he he full on launched a, a persecution against uh, Christians, including um, uh, crucifying them and lighting them on fire to light his gardens during dinner parties. Um, one historian talks about being in the garden, um, attempting to talk to Nero, and these Christians are screaming. Uh, from the persecution, and Nero's just making small talk. Like, no, just oblivious to, to anybody's suffering. Um, they believe that he, um, um, uh, that, that he killed his own mother. Um, there, there's one uh, story that went around about he believed uh, his wife was cheating on him, and so he ended up having her killed. Um, about three days later, he felt such remorse about that that he was walking uh, through the, the streets and he saw a young boy that resembled his wife that he had killed and um, he brought the boy in, had him castrated and made him dress like his wife. Um, and so the guy was way, way off, all right? Um, a lot of people think that the allusions in the first century um, to the Antichrist were about Nero, that they considered him to be um, the Antichrist, and if you define it um, as just somebody that's anti everything Jesus stood for, um, Nero Nero would certainly apply. So um, this is who they were living under. All right, um, a, a guy of this mental instability. Um, that this guy, and like I said, there's a lot of you know. You think those stories are a little risque? There's a lot of stories that you know are just in hit. You, you can look them up in history, but I would never share them publicly. So um, because they're so depraved. So. Um, this is um, who he's writing to. In addition, you had these false teachings um, that were kind of floating around the first century um, that were, were, were being impacted about this time period. Um, so you had a false teaching about circumcision, that in order to be considered Christian, you needed to be circumcised as a Jewish person would. Um, you had a false teaching um, about grace that was floating around, um, that because of the grace of Jesus that you can live however you want to live and, and do whatever you want to do. Um, and then there was this false teaching that the writer of Hebrews alludes to on angels. And uh, we'll talk about this in the sermon in a little more detail, but the gist of the teaching was that because um, angels are were were in um, the spiritual realm, because they're they're angelic in that way, and because Jesus was fully human, that angels should be worshipped and Jesus should not. It is is essentially the, the teaching that was floating around um, the, the first century, and so these are these are the teachings that that were uh, kind of floating through. Um, and uh, this Nero 
And these teachings, I believe, are what caused the writer of Hebrews, whoever he or she is, um, to, to, write their, to write their book. So, um, so let's look at um, a couple passages in Hebrews and begin to develop some theme together. All right? um, Hebrews 2.1. Anyone have any comments or questions on any of that, by the way? I'll talk less in the coming weeks. So, um, comments or questions? <coughs> All right. <coughs> Hebrews 2.1. Somebody want to jump in and read that? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Okay. All right. So we get this kind of um, uh, first um, uh, idea of um, theming uh, in Hebrews 2.1 about um, that we do not... By the way, I forgot to mention that you have false teaching, you have Nero, uh, and then you have just the general difficulty of being a Jewish Christian in the first century. That we'll, we'll talk about that this morning as well. And so you've got this um, whole kind of um, pot brewing uh, that was causing a lot of people to kind of renounce Christianity and maybe return um, to Judaism or to buy into one of these false teachings that... Um, would take you out of the Christian stream. Um, I think if you kind of have as a belief system that angels should be worshipped and more than Jesus should be, you're probably out of the stream at that point. And so the writer is the writer is um, concerned. And so you'll see um, this as as a theme uh, in, in the book of Hebrews about about drifting away. All right, three one, three one. Um, let me just actually have you read, whoever's going to read it, 3 1 through 3 14. It's a lot. <clears throat> Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. If we hold on to our courage and hope of which we boast. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for 40 years saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you as a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. All right, so one of the themes is not to be, should put not here, not to be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Right. So, what do you um, what do you see in that passage as some of the ways that the writer proposes that we not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness? What are uh, what are some of uh, the, uh, the big ideas or the ways in that passage? Encourage daily. What's that? But he ends up with encouraging daily. Right. Okay. En encouragement. Yeah. Encouragement daily. Yeah. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Okay, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Yeah. 
Hold on to the end. I hold on to the end. I think he's also establishing how the difference between like Moses and Jesus. Right. You know, because Jews obviously held Moses in yes. high esteem. Right. And yeah. you know, he's telling them that Jesus is right. even better than right. Moses. There were, yeah, there were some things um, I've been studying for the Hebrews 3 uh, sermon, and there were some things that were, were said in some of the commentaries that I knew, but, like, I just didn't think of the power of them, that, like, nobody's written down more scripture than Moses. Um, no, be, Moses is mentioned more in the New Testament than even Abraham. Um, and, and so, yeah, Moses is kind of a, um, a big deal. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he's uh, in chapter three in particular, and, and going into chapter four, he's articulating the superiority of the ministry of Jesus. Um, anything else that you see in there? All right, so we see that he's he's going to be teaching us about to, to not drift away. He's going to be teaching us to avoid um, sin's deceitfulness. Um, let me show you uh, chapter four, verse one. Uh, therefore, uh, since the promise of entering rest still stands, let us be careful uh, that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Uh, for we also have the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obey. So then you have this idea of falling short. Okay. Right. Six eleven. I can get somebody to read uh, six verse eleven. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. All right. Um, This is something the writer of Hebrews will hit on uh, in kind of a famous passage of scripture uh, later on that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So um, that there's a sureness of hope. And he's obviously addressing people um, that either because of false teaching or because of family pressure or because of persecution that they're struggling a little bit with how can I be sure? Right? I've kind of forsaken family. I've kind of done all this stuff uh, to follow to follow after uh, to follow after Jesus. How can I be sure? And so, part of the, the, one of the themes of the Book of Hebrews um, is uh, is to help to be sure. All right, um, Hebrews ten twenty three. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So you see that idea of hope again? Um, 10.35, can I have somebody read that? Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. All right. You have to think about people undergoing family pressure, people undergoing persecution, people undergoing... Um, all of these things, there, there surely must have been um, a sense or a feeling of not being rewarded. You know, there, there's nothing, what, what's, what's the good here? Um, <clears throat> all right, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right. So that is uh, a idea. All right, these are sub-themes. That is an idea that you will begin to see uh, throughout the book of Hebrews. It's stated in different ways and in, in different times, but um, it is the idea of fixing our eyes on Jesus. That the writer of Hebrews, it, it becomes very, very clear um, in the early chapters, and then it just continues on the writer of Hebrews has an objective of lifting Jesus very high for us. He has a high view, a high respect, a high worship of Jesus. And he is going, for these people undergoing family pressure and persecution and doubt about the gospel, he is, as his goal or her goal, he is going to lift high Jesus. And he believes, or she believes, uh, that if, if they do that, if they lift high Jesus, it's going to help people to not drift away. It's going to help them to not fall into sins to see Jesus. It's going to help them uh, to keep the faith and to keep their hope and to not drift away and to not throw away their confidence. That this leads to all this in the book of Hebrews. And so from the very beginning of, of chapter 1, um, you're going to see him, and we're going to look at this. I think we actually are going to have time to do it. We're going to look at it um, in Hebrews 1. Uh, you'll, you'll see him uh, begin uh, to, to lift Jesus high, and he's going to continue that right on through multiple chapters of, of lifting him high so that uh, they won't give in to these false teachings and family pressure and persecution because being a Jewish Christian in the first century was hard. It's an understatement, honestly. It was very hard. Um, and so uh, this is... This is his strategy, is fix your eyes on Jesus, and then all this stuff. When your eyes are on Jesus, this stuff kind of begins to work its way out. But he's going to lift Jesus really high. And I think we really, really need this message right now. Uh, that I was just kind of reading through the book of Hebrews last year and didn't have a full concept of like what the book was about at that point, just a real quick reading. And I thought, you know, we usually try to treat um, January, the first Sunday of January to Easter is one series. And so it's kind of our, our opportunity to study a bigger idea or, or a bigger text. So I, I think we'll do Hebrews. I just kind of felt drawn to it. I really think our culture um, needs this message. And it's not that um, it, it's not that we're, we're persecuted because we're not. And it's not that we're in the same boat as the Jewish Christians because we're not in that same boat. But there is a um, discontent. Um, there's uh, anxiety about future. There's there's a concern, um, and I just think we need to get back to this. So this is what Hebrews is going to help us to do: is lift up Jesus really high, and then whether or not you're thrilled about the tax cuts will work itself out. Whether or not you're thrilled about any number of things politically or with your family or whatever, that stuff begins to fit uh, to, to to find its place when we fix our eyes on Jesus. So. Um, let's start in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. I'll take just uh, a few minutes and we'll go over this quick and then we're going to start right there again next week and go into a little more detail. Um, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in the last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. And so already he's, he's lifting Jesus high because um, he is, and we'll talk about this this morning in more detail, but he is placing Jesus at the scene of the creation story. This makes Jesus different than Moses, right? Because Moses wasn't present at the creation story. Um, th this makes Jesus different than Abraham. This makes Jesus different than every other prophet. He's identifying for us that Jesus is different. He holds um, a prominent place to us. And then you will see this theme unfold uh, throughout the book of Hebrews about Jesus being the Son. That 
Moses and Abraham and Joshua, all of those Old Testament prophets, he'll say, uh, chapter 3, I'm going to just call it chapter 3. He'll, he'll talk in that passage about they were servants in the house, but Jesus is the son over the house. And so even as New Testament Christians, we have been served by Abraham. We have been served by Moses, but Jesus is over the whole thing. So what is Jesus doing? He's sustaining the universe. That's all he's doing, <laughs> right? Kind of a big job, right? Um, so, so he's different, all right? And then uh, verse 3, I believe, um, could be called uh, the theme of the book of Hebrews. That if you wanted to work on memorizing a passage of scripture while we're doing this study together, I think verse 3 would be a great one to do. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. That's Jesus. Jesus is greater. Jesus is superior. He is the sun over the whole thing. And so he's the radiance of God's glory. And we'll, we'll talk about this this morning a little bit in, uh, in more detail, but we... We have a very independent, we're, we're a very independent culture. And so we have a specific view of sons. That our, our job as parents is to get our sons to a place where they're independent and they will choose their own path. Daughters too, but you know, I'm, I want to kind of stick with the son metaphor in, in terms of Hebrews. That was not the culture this was written into. This was written into a high honor culture where the son's goal was to follow in the father's footsteps in business. The son's goal was to work with and for the father. And so when Jesus talks about being the son of God, we hear special, unique, but independent. That's not how anybody in the first century would have heard it. When they heard Jesus say, I am the son of God, they understood exactly what he was saying, that he's God in human flesh. And there's a few stories that Jesus tells about a worker sending the son to, to, the, to the laborers in the field, and when he went to them, he was the owner in human flesh. And they all understood that. That's why in that one story where they beat the son and kill him becomes so problematic, right, uh, for, for the owner of the house. Because, man, that's my son. That, that's my son that you've done. That he, he was the exact representation of my glory. And so we think of son in one way in our Western kind of independent frame of thought. In this day, they understood exactly what the son meant that he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the power of his word. So uh, verse 4, So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And over the next couple chapters uh, that we'll be studying together, this is the theme. The, 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 um, the name Son is greater than the name Angel. Right? The name Son is greater than the name Moses. The name Son is greater than the name Abraham. The, the name Son is, is the greatest. And, and so um, the writer of Hebrews is going to begin to unfold this over the next uh, couple of chapters, and we'll begin to study that next week. All right? That's the introduction. All right? So thank you uh, all for being here.